Bartholomew was flayed alive while trying to make converts for Christ in Armenia. A man named Antipas was cooked to death in a bronze bull for declaring the Lord Jesus. Sebastian was shot with arrows, but he survived, which is awesome. We love when a story ends like that, except for uh, it doesn't, sadly. Um, And he was instead clubbed to death later on because he went and and tried to meet the emperor to tell him about Jesus and and met him in a hallway and, and was savagely beaten to death. John the Apostle was boiled in oil, but he miraculously survived and was later exiled as one of the only apostles to not be killed for his faith, to die at an old age. Today we're going to read through um, and we're going to be talking about the, the ending, a couple of the ending chapters in the book of Revelation. We're going to be talking about Revelation chapter 20 and 21. And so you're definitely going to need your Bibles today as we go through and we study this amazing passage of scripture. And as you're turning in those chapters, I want to tell you a little bit of, a, of the dirty secret about the book of Revelation. Actually, it's probably not the dirty secret. It's the, the good news about the book of Revelation because it is good news. The book of Revelation is not meant to be a terrifying book for you and I to read. And I know that should be surprising to some of us because we've grown up reading through the book of Revelation thinking, oh my goodness, I can't imagine reading this book and thinking anything other than there's dragons and beasts and people with four faces and things that are happening and I don't understand this and so I'm kind of freaked out and my crazy neighbor keeps telling me that we're getting, we're all getting the mark of the beast and all of this amazing stuff is happening. I don't know what to do with this. And so I think that Revelation is a little too complicated, a little too hard, a little too difficult for me. And I'm here to tell you today that the book of Revelation is supposed to be an encouragement to us as believers. Now, if you're an unbeliever in the room today and you read through the book of Revelation, yeah, you're probably going to be uncomfortable. You're going to read through it. You're going to realize, oh no, somebody other than me wins. But as a Christian, we get to look forward to the book of Revelation coming to pass. And so we shouldn't be scared of it. And if, in fact, the book is meant by the Apostle John as an encouragement to us as Christians, then I think we should see it that way as we dive down into it. You see, the book, I believe, can be simplified down after the first couple of chapters where there's some letters to the churches to three main ideas that are summed up in the last couple of chapters, which we're going to study today. And these three ideas are first, that evil seems to be powerful. Evil seems to be powerful. Next, we learn that God is powerful. Now notice the difference in language. We'll talk about that later. And last, God, and by extension, his people, will win forever. Evil seems powerful, God actually is powerful, and God, and by extension his people, will win forever. And so our first point, I want to prove some of this out to you, is found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. And here we get, after this thousand years has passed, Satan is released from his prison, and he seems powerful. He says, and when a thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. We're going to pause there. We're going to pause there and, and there's a reason Why? Because right now, it seems like Revelation is setting up this enormous Lord of the Rings style assault on the people of God. The armies are gathered around waiting to pounce, waiting to siege the people 
until they can be besieged no more. And yet, there's something else going on. The psalmist writes about the heart of the wicked in Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and he says this, Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. Evil seems powerful. The evil will always saber rattle, will always try to fight against us. They will surround us on all sides and everything will seem lost. You and I know this feeling of being surrounded by evil occasionally, right? We know that we look up to a system of political leaders and a government that currently seems to be designed to push the killing of babies to the forefront and to strip away help for those who need it. When we look at lists of the most searched websites in the whole world, we don't find Bible Gateway or Ligonier Ministries. We find pornography and get-rich-quick schemes. When we look out at the world, we see so much evil and so much pain and so much destruction. But that's only part of the story. That's only a part of the story. Because God has promised something to the church. The gates of hell will not stand. They will not stand. They cannot stand before the power of God and his church. Evil seems powerful. But... God is powerful. Before we turn back over to Revelation, let's continue to read in Psalm chapter 2. And let's read in verses 4 through 5. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. Now, we expect. The psalmist has written this whole thing out, right? He, he's noticed that this is what happens. Evildoers shake their sabers, they yell at you, they surround you, they do all of these evil things, and yet God in his anger rebukes them and terrifies them. And let's look back to Revelation chapter 20, beginning in the second part of verse 9. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. So in case you were you forgot already, this was not a long battle. The, the, all the powers of hell, Satan and his minions and all the people which would follow him destroyed in an instant. Destroyed in a moment. Destroyed in the, the utterance of destruction. The greatest power that anyone could muster against God is nothing against his almighty power. Verse 10, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. God's consuming wrath takes over. God's consuming wrath, which has been held at bay by one of his attributes that we love, that he is gracious and kind and, and, and merciful to us. His wrath now comes into play. And God is powerful above all things above everything that comes against him, above any power, any principality, any government, any person, anything that comes against the church, God is more powerful. God is greater than anything. 
Satan is the biggest threat, right? We would say Satan from the beginning has been the greatest threat that we can think of to what God is doing in his creation. That creation would point all of the glory to him and Satan has been trying to steal that glory. He's the best threat that he has, that we, have, that we know of. And yet, God snuffs him out in a moment without even a big fight scene, just gone like that. The devil that tempted us to fall and started this whole long fight destroyed in a moment. Evil seems powerful, but God actually is powerful. But as a footnote here, people are involved. People are involved in this process. People have chosen sides and now need to be judged based on their chosen side. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 talks about these people. It says, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, there are great consequences for following the evil one. Because God is great and the evil one is not. The evil one seems great. He seems attractive. He seems like someone you would want to follow. And yet he is snuffed out in an instant along with all of his followers. Remember, church, who you follow. Remember, church, the the power of the one who you follow are under the command of all the people that, are, that rebelled against God are sent into the lake of fire. And they suffer for eternity because of a hopeless rebellion against God, a rebellion that doesn't end at this point. These dead people will go into hell and still sin and still kick against the will of God forever, adding to their punishment day in and day out, hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. Sin is rebellion against God, but it is a pointless, hopeless, doomed rebellion against a God who is powerful, even while evil seems powerful. All are to be judged as rebels against God, except for those whose names are written and found in the book of life. And this is where John takes us out of this narrative and into a very different kind of narrative. Because we've seen how powerful God is over and above the evil one. And how powerful really is he? Powerful enough to save for himself a people. Powerful enough that people would be murdered to spread the great message of this powerful, awesome, almighty God. In the beginning of this message, we started out talking through just a few of these stories. And all of these people have murdered, have lost, have been persecuted for spreading the gospel. And yet, if you really know how the power dynamics shake out, you know that they lost nothing and instead gained the world. They did not value their lives over the ministry of the gospel. They did not value their comfort over the spread of the glorious word of Jesus Christ because they knew how powerful, how amazing, how good, how glorious 
our God really is. And now they have a different destiny in store. Verses 1 through 8 in, verse, in chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. How much do we want to look to God and see this? happen to us? How much do we want to look forward to being with God forever, the one who is all-powerful, the one who is all-knowing, and we look forward to spending eternity with him? That is the central message of the book of Revelation. It is to encourage us as a church to never stop pushing forward, to never stop fighting against evils in the world, to never stop spreading the gospel because our God is almighty, all-powerful, all-glorious, all-good redeemer and father to each and every one of us as Christians. It ought to be encouraging. Church, do not let someone tell you that the book of Revelation scares them. I know, I've been there, I have lived that life. And instead, when you read the book of Revelation, notice how often God is portrayed as awesome and glorious and holy. It is every single time. And that's our Father. That's our God. That's our all-powerful leader. The one who we follow. And so evil seems powerful, right? It can seem powerful in our lives today. We recognize that God is powerful, and I hope that you've seen that in your own life. I hope that you've seen that through the text of Revelation today. I hope that that has been clear to you. But there's a third thing that I said in the beginning of this message. Evil seems powerful. God actually is powerful. And because God is so powerful, so great, and so holy, we know that we look forward to the win with him. Not that we're so good. Not that we're so great. Not that we're so powerful, but that God is. And so, by extension, we win along with God. And the message of the book of Revelation, to take it on the broadest possible strokes, is that we ought to be encouraged because we will win not by our own strength, but by the strength of Christ on the cross for each and every one of us. Read with me in verses 5 through 8 of chapter 21. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. Do you hear that? What did Jesus say? As he was being crucified, it is finished. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. We look forward to the wind. But as a reminder, John writes these words, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Notice he doesn't let us get away from a holy life. He says, Christians, you ought to be known for this. You ought to be following the fruit of the Spirit. You ought to be living lives that are pointed at Christ. 
and being sanctified, that we may know you by your fruits. And so church, I think this begs a question for us today. Will you be rebels or will you fight on the side of the conquering king? Maybe in your life today, you needed just that encouragement. Maybe in your life today, you needed to just not feel like the world was pushing in on all sides, and that's what you needed to hear today. And I hope that you leave this place today encouraged, because God is good. He is powerful. He is holy. He is almighty. He is so amazing to each and every one of us. Maybe that's what you needed to hear today. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe someone is persecuting you. Hopefully not by being boiled in oil. Hopefully not by being killed in the streets. Maybe in some smaller way. And I hope that you would recognize today that your goal, your job while you're here on this earth is to preach the gospel. To love your enemies. Because in the end, the only thing that matters is are you Christ's or are you not? And I hope that that would encourage you. If you're a Christian who is struggling and you've t- dipped your toe in the world of the evil one, get it out. Cut it off, as Jesus says. Lest you fall. If you're an unbeliever here today and you're hearing about our conquering God, he loves you. That fact is insane, but he loves you. He wants you to leave the army of Satan and join with him by his grace. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal that truth to you today. Will you be a rebel? Damned to hell. Or will you live your life in service to the King? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would hear your words, Lord, that we would see that your book of Revelation that you gave to John would be one in which we can learn to be encouraged as Christians. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see how powerful, how glorious, how awesome, how holy you are, and to praise you, God. God, I pray that you would be with people who listen to this message and and hear that they need to change, that they need to repent. Lord, may your Holy Spirit alight in their lives. Lord, for the Christians in here that feel beat up, restore them. Help them to hang on to your almighty power and grace for their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.